now is the time where it starts. Now that the first paper's out, now we get to see the flurry of snowflake papers coming down like snow. Exactly. And as people find out new stuff, and it's always fun to watch that because, you know, you look on archive every day and, you know, every few days paper shows up as people try to constrain it. Now, reddening, Aster, and that also is an indication of age, right? In other words, reddened objects, that's the interstellar medium doing that. Is, isn't that correct? To some degree, yeah. So we expect that the ISM is going to is going to help redden these objects as it passes through. And so that will indicate that it's relatively old. Of course, we also, we don't have a lot of ISMs. We only have three of them. And we're not quite sure what their composition looks like. And so the thing that we're going to run into is it's very hard for us to determine, is this reddening definitely from the ISM? Or is it red because this object is just red? And that's what this ob and that's what these objects look like. And so we are doing our best to try to understand how these objects work and how they get older and how they change as they pass through the interstellar medium. But it's really a, a, a difficult to constrain question. And there's also even there are also even more sort of I'll say exotic suggestions. Like I don't know if you you've had Daryl Seligman on before. Oh, many times, yes. I don't know if you've ever talked talked to Jenny Bergner. But she and he had a paper two years ago now where they showed that as an object like a Muamua moves through the interstellar medium, cosmic rays can produce H2 in the surface. And then the water itself just changes phase, which releases the H2 and causes the non-gravitational acceleration. And so you can have these sort of weird exotic effects of moving through the ISM that are very, very difficult to constrain and very difficult for us to understand since they only occur in the ISM itself. Now, the path again, back to that, Tessa. How close, the closest this is gonna get to a planet in the solar system is Mars, right? This will not pass anywhere near Earth, but it will pass by Mars, correct? Yes, that's correct. The object will pass within, I believe it's 0.19 AU, which leaves a lot of great opportunities to do some observing with some missions that are already there and also to perhaps directly image the object if we're able to pull resources and take advantage of that close approach. I think that's one of the coolest aspects of this mm -hmm. in that we will be able to serendipitously observe an interstellar comet with a probe in orbit of Mars. I don't think that happens very often. <laughs> Definitely not, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a new one. Now, the brightness of this object is very, very dim, obviously, but not necessarily dim for an asteroid, you know, or, a, or an interstellar comet or object. Is this within the range of a very well-equipped amateur to also do observations? I think so, yeah. I believe that it, it may be visible. I think that even an amateur astronomer was a part of some of the follow-up observation. I may be wrong. Aster, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe that... Going to be completely honest, I have no idea what the magnitude limit an amateur astronomer can see to is. Yeah, I, I'm i not sure either, but I... It's I'm, currently magnitude 15. Yeah. Which is pretty dim, and I'm trying to recall the limiting magnitude of a telescope of a given size. I think you're going to need a pretty big telescope, certainly at least a foot, and very low light pollution, but... You can do it with a, the meter-sized telescope, but those are not exactly amateur astronomer quality. I'm going to unfortunately say that I do not know the answer. My guess is going to, it's in that bounds where maybe is a possibility. I'll also say that right now it's going to be very, very hard to make observations just because it's in the middle of the galactic plane. And so all the detections that we've had to do so far need very complicated algorithms to try to remove background stars that amateur astronomers will not necessarily have access to. It's just very, very difficult to separate this object out from its background. That's making observations difficult with even, you know, s with small or large pixeled professional quality instruments. And it's going to make things even harder for amateur astronomers who do not have the resources that we would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a problem. Well, anybody yeah. that's looked at the Milky Way <laughs> with a telescope, you know that, that uh, that's very, very, very dense and picking it out, which is amazing it was discovered in the first place, right now, you know, at this time, because it's that's hard for even you astronomers to do. Now, what was the circumstances of the discovery? In other words, 
What, what went into finding and picking this out? What happened? So Atlas, the instrument is a, an all sky survey looking for asteroids and comets. And it serendipitously, as many of these surveys do, found this object. It has very good background subtracting algorithms. And so it managed to pick it out and got astrometry over the course of a few days. And the orbit fit to that astronomy astrometry has an eccentricity of six, which is just really ridiculously large and is absolutely inconsistent with a solar system object. Yeah. Isn't, isn't, isn't the threshold one? <laughs> the threshold is one. Yeah. Uh, and there's uncertainties on that number, right? But at plus or minus two, still too big. Mm. And so the, the, the consequence that we ran into is that we found it like that. And then we have follow-ups to further constrain the astrometry to get better and better and better observations. And that ends up in the discovery itself. This is also sort of how we found Muamua and Borisov. Although well, Borisov is a bit of a weird story. But Muamua was found in a very similar way using the PanStars instrument. And we're expecting that this is going to be the primary way that we find ISOs in the future. Is these large-scale surveys looking for asteroids, amongst other things finding an asteroid, fitting an orbit to it, and finding that that orbit is not at all equivalent to that of a solar system object. And then with that, we can start doing follow-ups and really nail down that it's definitely the neutral object and take further looks at it. The Vera Rubin Observatory has come alive and it's now making observations. We're all very excited about it. Very timely indeed. And that's my next question because they, they turned it on, looked at one spot of the sky and discovered over 2000 asteroids in a week. Yeah. Very <laughs> timely mm -hmm. occurrence. I mean, it was just stunning. I believe it was 10 hours after an observation. Yeah. It was just, it's just, it was just mind boggling. <laughs> yes. Of what use will Vera Rubin and that survey be in trying to characterize this new object? Quite a bit. Obviously, we're we're so actually I'll say not for this new object. Rubin is not a is not a targeting instrument. It is not going to be looking at three I and trying to figure out its properties. It is primarily a survey instrument, and I don't know the exact fraction, but it, it's at least ninety as large as one hundred percent of its initial ten year time is devoted to the legacy survey of space and time, which is just a truly massive all sky survey of huge amounts of data every night, finding transients like this object, finding transients in the extra galactic, in the galaxy, in the extra, in outside the galaxy, and just really getting a very wide survey to pretty deep levels. That being said, it's a big telescope, but we're not going to be devoting it to looking at this object. The big thing that Ruben is going to be doing for us is finding a lot more objects like this. Depending on the estimates, somewhere between as many as 100 over the next 10 years, as many as 10 over the next 10 years. We don't really know, but that's what we're expecting out of Ruben as it comes online is to find a lot, a lot more of these. And it's a very happy coincidence that we found 3i directly after Ruben came online. And the, the, the 2000 objects is just a proof of how powerful this new observatory is and how good it is at finding objects like this. It I, I found it very poetic that, you know, the telescope originally was the LSST mm -hmm. before it got named. And now the survey comes out as LSST. Yeah. That was on purpose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm excited about it because you're right. This is going to find many more objects. And for asteroid mapping, it's Absolutely. just shocking. Very, very fine instrument. Doing observations mm -hmm. in a way that we really... N never did anything quite like this. I mean, we have false sky surveys and <laughs> yeah. stuff, but nothing like this. Yeah. And it's very exciting that it's... Uh, nothing to these magnitudes. Yeah, and, and the success it's already seeing, is, you know, it reminds me of the, the Webb Space Telescope. You know, it was just mm -hmm. stunning. 